TG Geeks, episode 99, October 10th, 2016. What do ghosts and Star Trek have in common? Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery, sci-fi, comics, film, horror, genre, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Keith Lane and we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm Ben Ragginson, also coming to you from, but... Uh, I uh, I was about to make a really bad joke about Hurricane Matthew, but decided against it. Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, we're safe here in Phoenix. We're safe here in Phoenix, yeah. From the hurricane. Yeah. Well, we have a really interesting interview for you this time. It uh, There's some very interesting connections in this uh, interview. And we're yeah, just gonna, some surprising we're gonna, connections. Yeah, we're going to just kind of let you discover those along with as we discover them. So here we go. And this week we have with us Stephen Manley. He is one of the stars of the film that was just released, Ghost Hunters, and he won a, an award recently uh, for his best performance as an actor in that film. So welcome to the show, Stephen. Hi, fellas. How are you? We're good. good. How good. are you doing? Doing fun. Uh, doing great. Thank you very, very much. Sure. So tell us... Um, Tell us who you are, because you have a, a, a rather interesting past as far as what you have done in film work and your uh, legacy, your history, your family history. Tell us tell us just a little briefly who you are, and then we'll talk about Ghost Hunters. How's that? Okay, terrific, terrific. Uh, I have been an actor for many, many years. I got my start in 1970. I thought it was 71, but then I looked at my SAG card, and it said member since 70. Oh, my God. So that's going back quite a ways. My uh, grandfather was a silent film actor. Oh. Uh, I'm adopted, but I was adopted into a, a family. And uh, my adopted mom, her dad, came over from Italy uh, as an immigrant many, many, many years ago in the early 1900s. And he got drafted into World War I, and they sent him over to France, and a week later the war ended. So oh, they put him on a ship, and they sent him back, and... Uh, now he was an American citizen, and he joined a circus, and he worked as a clown for a long time, and eventually the circus dumped out in Los Angeles, and he found D.W. Griffith casting Italian-speaking men to play Roman soldiers in the film Intolerance. That's fascinating. And he got a, yeah, he got a gig in that, and I still have his costume uh, test, Ooh. his picture. It's a hand-tinted wow. black and white photograph, you know, with those pastel hand tints that they would do by hand oh, wow. of his wardrobe test from that film. And he loved the business and he stayed in it until 1966. You see him popping up everywhere with the Marx Brothers, with Charlie Chaplin, with uh, Gene Kelly and Singing in the Rain. Guess who Gene Kelly hands the umbrella to at the end of that big routine? Oh, no you know? kidding! Passes oh, it wow. the air, passes Far it off. To we just saw that not too long ago. Yeah, it's one of our oh, favorite films. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, there's a fellow who's getting drenched at yeah. the end of uh, Singing in the Rain, the routine, and Gene Kelly hands uh, my grandfather the umbrella. Oh, that's so, wonderful! Wow, that is incredible. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love yeah. that. That's a nice little... St it it kind of gives a personal touch for us the next time yeah. we see it. Exactly, oh, exactly. And uh, what else? He was a stunt double also. He stunt doubled for Edward G. And he stubbled, uh, stunt doubled for Peter Laurie. Wow. And uh, he loved the business. And uh, he tried to get my mom uh, to become an actress, but she was more interested in going and getting suntan rather than <laughs> <laughs> you know, going to her acting classes and everything. So he lived with us after his wife died. And uh, it was only natural. Uh, for me to join in his footsteps, because ever since I can remember, I was closer to him than I was to my parents. You know, our relationship was very much like, you know, Alfredo and the little boy in Cinema Paradiso. Mm -hmm. I was always hanging out with him. 
and he still had his old makeup kit, which I still have, and wow. he'd show me how to do makeups and how to work with nose putty and what they used to do in the silent era to make the eyes pop out. And, you know, he had hundreds and hundreds, thousands maybe, of still pictures of himself from everything from singing in the rain to Frankenstein to, you know, he was a Mexican bandit or he was a German soldier or, you know, I mean, all of those things. So when I was very young, he took me down to the guild and I was able to get a SAG card uh, because I had done a couple of a couple of things at CBS, I had done All in the Family mm-hmm. and the Carol Burnett Show, and wow. one of those actually got me my SAG card. Far out. And uh, right, I had I had misquoted uh, a little bit, thinking that my grandfather spoke in Italian to the head of the guild at the time, which he did, and I walked out with a SAG card. <laughs> but it was all right around the same time, so I think I became eligible, and then you know I started to book some gigs. When a talent agent saw me on a show called Juvenile Jury back in the day, it was hosted by a man named Gene Barry, and the agents oh, would, yes. would watch that show. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Gene Barry of, uh, of the Match Game Show. Yes, yes. You know, and the, these agents would kind of watch these shows to see if there was a kid or some talent that they could represent. And the lady thought I was precocious enough that she could <laughs> take me on and get me some work. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, and there it was. And when I was a little guy, you know, for many, many years, I got cast as a European war orphan or a child with rickets or I died of some disease. You know, <laughs> I was very much a very solemn Euro looking kid. Wow. So if, if there was something like that to be cast, I usually got the job. So I had many ailments and I starved a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> While making a little bit of money. <laughs> kind of a... Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's how I got started, and that's where that all came from. And uh, my grandfather uh, was just overjoyed about that. Unfortunately, he passed away only about five years into my 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 soon to be you know lifestyle uh, and career. I was on a feature film called The Hindenburg. Oh, yeah. Where George C. Scott, yeah, was the Luftwaffe colonel trying to find out if there was a plot to sabotage the Hindenburg. Mm-hmm. And I was on that for months. And uh, actually, the very last uh, week of that, uh, my grandfather passed oh. away while I was on location, you know. So I miss him to this day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in a macabre way, we'll get to it later. He actually helped me with my performance in Ghost Hunters uh, about the. Uh, eight, nine months ago, but we can get to that later, right? Uh, Yes. (laughs) I I, I just see that you were... Yeah, yeah, that's where where it all started, you know, and uh, I went on to work on the Universal lot for most of my my younger career. I basically kind of grew up there and sometimes across the street over at the Warner Brothers lot right there in the valley, but I worked all over the place, and it was a wonderful thing. I was very fortunate. There were a lot of old timers still around who knew my grandfather. So they kept a good eye on me on these sets for the most part. And, uh, you know, there was never any funny business or or weird things. You know, a lot of my contemporaries kind of went down a a very bad path Mm -hmm. in the 70s and stuff as young people. But I had guys who would sense that coming and they'd say, hey, Steve, go in the workshop. We're going to show you how we make breakaway glass or we're going to show you how something is sculpted, or this is how a lens works, or you know you're standing in that shot, this is how we're going to light this. and you know. So I got to know a lot of that stuff very early on, and I felt a good responsibility to keep my grandfather mm-hmm. happy you know, and have a good work ethic, which is what he instilled in me. So that's, that was the start of all of this. I, yeah. I envy you. Yeah. I, I really do. Uh, I mean, a lot of people who are on the outside, I mean, you know, people like me, I mean, I... I Growing up, I've always looked at the movie industry, the TV and the movie industry, you know, you know, with the, this, this gold glitter, polished kind mm-hmm. of look that, you know, when you, when you really, you know, you know, take several layers off, you realize it, it's actually kind of dank and, and ugly in places. Uh, but at the same time, it sounds like that, that you really got to experience the more positive aspect of that. Uh, being the, the working actor and, and the exposure that you got. And, and I really am <laughs> horribly jealous that you got to have that. No. Well, I, t- I tell you what, I'll share whatever you want, my friend. And, uh, you know, uh, trying to give you a piece of all of these things. I 
I had a great man, you know, yeah, Stephen yeah. E. Soldi, and his IMDb keeps growing as people discover things that were unreleased or that are just coming on DVD or, wow. or seeing the light of day. But Steve really, like I said, it was very much like Alfredo and the little boy in that. And uh, I spent all my time with him. And it, it was very important that uh, I have a good sense of work ethic and stay away from, you know, uh, a lot of the, some, you know, the glitz and the glamour can run away with a lot of it people. Yes, it can. can. And, you know, yes. when, I, when I saw craftsmen slaving to make people look good or to get the show uh, finished or, you know, to better something, I, I really, really took that to heart. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, film sets that people say, oh, the grips. Let me tell you, man, the grips work their ass off. Yes, yeah, they, they do. do. It's not an easy job. No, yeah. no it isn't. And, uh, yeah, and those guys have a very uh, specific uh, job that they have to do. they got to be trained for it. And I tell you what, man. Craft service isn't easy either, <laughs> yeah, and a lot no, of people exactly. would be really, really <laughs> shocked to hear that you know the PAs, the ADs, the unit production manager, and the craft service fellows, you know, they they're a part of the product uh, the producers guild. Oh. Yeah. Oh wow. That's so yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that for a long time. Yeah. So all the jobs are difficult and yeah. very specific, you know. And when you have a appreciation for that, you don't make life difficult. On right. a film set, oh, it's, yeah. it's hard enough just to get a shot off the ground, you know. Yeah, yeah. we interviewed a, a director uh, just last weekend, and before he struck it out on his own, I mean, he was uh, an assistant for uh, the Warner's uh, for the for the, the TV series uh, Supernatural on mm -hmm. uh, Warner's lot, and yeah, he talked about how he was just always. Always on the go. It was a very, very busy mm -hmm. time for him, but it, it shows that it's not mm -hmm. just about the you know the the big actors, the big name actors, or the director, or the producer. I mean, it's everybody mm -hmm. has a very vital part to play. So yes. it, it's nice to hear that from you about how all the working uh, parts of the machinery all have to work together to to come up with that, that thing that we see. Yeah, that's right. You know, a producer uh, told me one time. He said, Steve, we're all PAs, all of us, yeah. in a sense. And boy, hey, man, it was, it was a great way to look at it. Yeah. 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 And it, keep, it, it, it adds also, a, it keeps people uh, sort of humble, I think. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So then you're, you're all working towards a mutual goal. Yeah. Was, yeah. Look, mm -hmm. Looking down your or up your IMDb um, Entries and I mean all of these shows. My God, that I watched as a kid. You know, Emergency, yeah. Poli Police Woman, The Rookies, Marcus Welby, MD. You got. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh! I Kung, probably saw those. Kung Fu, the series. Kung Fu. Yeah. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Oh, no, are you talking the the original one on ABC? Yes, the original 1972. The, the original Kung yeah. Fu. Yes. Holy I, cow! I, I love that show. <laughs> Holy cow! By the way. All of these seem to be popping up on over-the-air antenna broadcasts like MeTV and Antenna yeah. and Cozy and all of those. Yeah. So, yeah, you can find me on all of that stuff. Yeah. I pop up once in a while. Exactly. But I, um, I, I, I played Kwai Chang King yeah. in the last uh, season of Kung Fu. Uh, Rodimus Para played him as a teenager. Right. And then I, pl I played him as a little guy before he shaved his head. <gasps> so they brought oh. that in the last season. I remember uh, to that. Give it some, yeah, to, get, to give it a little bit more depth there and to go back a little farther in, in uh, David Carradine's history. Wow, I remember yeah. watching that. Far yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, I think on my website there's a picture of me in a Chinese outfit with a cap on. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, and then there was Adam-12. And then we wind mm -hmm. up. Love Boat and 1984. Mm -hmm. What happened yeah. in 1984? In 1984, oh, there was a certain mm -hmm. movie that came out, which uh, I think a lot of uh, sci-fi genre fans were really chomping at the bit to mm -hmm. watch. And you played a very mm -hmm. specific character in that film, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. That was a great job. With a great director, very nice man, fantastic voice. <laughs> and, of course, we are talking about Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Mm -hmm. And so for mm -hmm. anybody who wants to know, which version of Spock did you play? 
There were four of us that played the young Spock because, of course, now everybody knows he he was growing on the Genesis planet from a baby to an adult where they could end with Leonard Nimoy as Spock. And I played him at 17 years old, better known now to my fan ladies as Ponfar Spock. (laughs) Yeah. Ah. (laughs) Yes. And... um, uh, I got the lion's share of the young Spock stuff. There was a young young fellow who played him at six years old who ran around naked in the snow. <laughs> and then there was a, a young fella. Yeah, there was a young fella who was 12 who, who you saw briefly in a tree trunk. Yes. Because every time the Genesis planet went through an upheaval, you know, Spock grew a little bit more. And then there was a young fellow who played him at 24 years old very briefly. He threw the Klingon across the set, and then there was another earthquake, and there was Leonard Nimoy. But I got the uh, the biggest role. I got Spock at 17, wow. who did Pon Far with Robin Curtis yes. you know, yeah. around the campfire. Yeah, and the weird thing was, I remember and, when I saw that in the theater, I kept thinking, and, and I, I'm not just saying this, uh, I, I really mean this in all, all sincerity. I saw it in the mm-hmm. theater, and I kept thinking, where did they get this guy? He's a dead ringer for Mark Leonard. Yes. Uh, my headshot at the time did resemble kind of a young Mark Leonard, which Leonard liked uh, an awful lot. Uh, Leonard had seen me in a TV series that I did for a friend of mine, a great fellow, uh, he and his wife, good friends to this day, David Jacobs, who created the original Dallas. And after Dallas, he had two short-lived series that I had beautiful roles in, both of them. One was called The Married Machine, and the other one was called The Secrets of Midland Heights. And Mm -hmm. there was an episode in the Midland Heights uh, TV series where my character had lost his mom while he was away on a trip. And a traveling carnival had come through the town, and lo and behold, there was a fortune teller gypsy in her tent. And she was very empathetic. And she tried to help my character find peace with my mom. And it was played by the wonderful actress, Zora Lambert, who had done all that Broadway work. She had a Tony under her belt. She actually had an Emmy uh, from a Kojak episode that she did where she was in flat playing a gypsy. And I spent a week with Zora Lambert with these very, very emotional, uh, sensitive scenes. And she was not being uh, vicious about it. Her character was very empathetic and warm and kind and just trying to help me with all of this stuff. And Leonard knew Zora Lambert, mm-hmm. and he had seen that episode, and he wanted me to bring some of that to the Pond Far sequences, even though there was no dialogue. That's how he found me. And it was just a great, uh, a great time uh, on that set. Everybody took it very, very seriously. And when Leonard said, look, Star Trek has treated me really wonderful all my life. Are you prepared that this is going to hang with you for the rest of your life? And he said, after I am long gone away, you know, you will continue to be a part of the Star Trek universe. So will you take it seriously like I have and be honorable and respect the fans and respect everything that's been created? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So when he was confident you know, that I would take it as serious as he did. I think that's what uh, cinched it for us, and off we were and running. I was getting my ears molded by Tom Berman, and they were sculpting some ear tips on it. And uh, a few weeks later, you know, Robin and I were doing a hot Bertolucci scene by the (laughs) fire on the Genesis planet. Wow, that that is incredible. It's it's a great scene, too, because uh, it, it... it really shows uh, the power of acting without the use of mm-hmm. words. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, That was. it was important to Leonard, uh, I should call him Mr. Nimoy. Uh, he treated us wonderful. It was his first uh, directorial outing on a feature film. It meant an awful lot to him, and, and the crew really appreciated that as well. But again... Some of my heroes have been the silent film actors great. I oh love Bon Chaney because my grandfather used to brag about working on The Hunchback and yeah. you know the makeup that he did and all of that kind of stuff. So he was one of my heroes. Buster Keaton was one yeah. of my heroes. I just saw City Lights with Chaplin for the umpteenth time oh my gosh. last week. You know, I oh. uh, love all of those actors. And 
the sequence had no dialogue, but like I said, uh, Mr. Nimoy really wanted us to convey a lot, and it was important to him because Pon Far had never been shown before, so he was very nervous about what was to be shown and not shown. Right. And he worked very uh, hard with Robin and I rehearsing, crafting it. Some of it was, you know, loosely improv. At one point, I kind of liked the feeling and grabbed uh, Robin's fingers, and she jumped a little bit, and he said, hey, I like that. And there was some more that we actually shot. Uh, Robin is a great actress, very passionate lady, uh, just a wonderful woman. And uh, she wanted to give more and show more. So she struggled a little bit and worked very hard with Leonard to show, but keep her Vulcan, you know, uh, mask on mm -hmm. at all times. Right, right. And I, I think I think it worked out very well. Lo and behold... Many, many years later, of course, I started to do Star Trek conventions, and I found I had a whole legion of wonderful Star Trek fan ladies, and I <laughs> come far with every single one of them <laughs> when, they come up, when they come up for a picture, and it's been wonderful. They've stuck by me and supported me for over a decade now, and they've wow. just been wonderful, uh, wonderful ladies. And actually, like I said, there was more to that sequence, and I remember Robin doing a lot more and us uh, interacting a lot more. And unfortunately, when Mr. Nimoy passed away, my wife found a picture that somebody had posted, and sure enough, Robin is reaching out, and she's got my face in her hands. Wow. And uh, Leonard Nimoy is standing there directing us. So, yes, there is an Italian Bertolucci uncut uh, region-free <laughs> DVD version of the Pond Heart. <laughs> <laughs> All that is That's fantastic. Uh, and, and I think it's also a wonderful testament to, uh, to the, the silent actors uh, mm -hmm. from that era, oh how you were able to take everything that you learned from your grandfather that he brought uh, from his time and to bring that into the present and show that, you know, just, just because you worked in silent film did not make you any less an actor than those that have speaking roles today. That, you know, very, very well said. Bravo. Most people don't realize those people were actually speaking dialogue when they were shooting those right. films, and they also improv quite a bit. And the reason Cheney was one of my heroes, his parents were deaf. Right. Oh, wow. And so from a, yeah, from I knew from that. a very, very early age, yeah, he had to learn how to communicate with them. And, of course, when he became an actor on stage, people could read, you know, from the very back row what was going on with him and then of course when he when he translated himself when we got to cinema and he started making films it just came through like a locomotive you know oh. and uh you know but all of those guys were very good at that very masterful and you can still learn uh from their performances the the thing that irritates me is all of those silent films were shot at normal speed yep. and they were projected at normal speed. So the movements were natural and the acting was natural when they were shown. But of course, when television came in in the late 40s through the 50s and they needed material to broadcast, they transferred everything at a sound speed which was too fast. Mm -hmm. And so most of us know silent films at the wrong speed. They're mm -hmm. all too fast. But sometimes now, they're they're transferring those on special editions and they're at the proper speed. Oh, good. And if you see Phantom, for instance, at the proper speed when Mary Philbin uh, takes the mask off of Janie right. while he's at the organ, and you see it at the at the normal natural speed, whoa, man, it's a totally different film. That's mm. nice to know so, because you know, we saw yeah. we saw Phantom of the Opera, the original, uh, some years mm -hmm. back, and mm -hmm. it, they played it at the faster speed, so it has. I, I don't want to call it comical. But if there's yeah. any chill factor that's supposed to be there, it is immediately removed by playing at that speed. So yeah, right. knowing that there's an attempt out there to restore mm -hmm. these things for uh, for regular speed, I I think that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Usually they pop up on PBS. So uh, I know that PBS has done that when they broadcast them. So yeah, you know we can learn from those actors tremendously. Absolutely. They they have a lot on their plate. A little interesting. Uh tidbit is uh, this week is a uh, wonderful silent film star Lillian Gish's birthday oh. 1887 oh. or 1884 yeah. I think yeah so yes so you just kind of a little well it tells piece. us that we need <laughs> to know. play maybe exactly. we need to pay more homage to the silent actors no, I, but I the fact that studios uh, and, and companies are distributing these things now 
at regular speed, I think is a great way to uh, to salute them. Now let's let's move a little bit forward here yeah. because you've done something <laughs> recently that we want to talk yeah. about. Okay. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, I'm guessing based on the title that this would be a horror film. Am I correct? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, and the film is called Ghost Hunters. And of course, uh, Keith right. and I every time every time we see the word ghost. Uh, with an ers at the end, we want to insert it with a bust. We are, we are, it's, yes, it's so exactly. easy to want to say Ghostbusters, and but no, th this is nothing comical. It's it's not mm -hmm. a silly movie. This is a serious horror film called Ghost right. Hunters. Tell us about how that mm -hmm. came about. Okay, here is how that came about. Uh, there's a director named Perry Tao, great young man, a lot of talent. He He's done some wonderful films, and his... Uh, his star is rising as a filmmaker. He did The Gene Generation. He did uh, The Curse of Sleeping Beauty. He did Cloud Atlas with Tom Hanks. Oh, uh, yes. He's worked a lot. He's got a great eye, very, very nice young man. And he was approached by the Asylum, and they wanted him to actually do a jokey version of Ghost Busters because they knew the new Ghostbusters was coming out. And Asylum's uh, bread and butter, so to speak, and they readily admit this, is what they call the mock busters. They sort of invented that term. They will take a film that's coming out and they'll do kind of a mock version of it, a little bit tongue in cheek, and they'll try and get that out around the same time. Well, they approached Perry about doing that and he said, I'm not going to make a joke for you. And they said, what? He said, if I'm going to do a horror film for you, it's going to be a straight-out horror film. Mm. And they took a risk on Perry, and they rolled the dice on him, and it was a big risk because they hadn't really done this before. And sure enough, Perry turned out Ghost Hunters, which was originally called Ghost House, but they changed it at the last minute to Ghost Hunters, and he turned them out a straight, dramatic horror film that felt like a hammer film from the 60s but oh. with a lot of modern stuff in there oh uh, you, you, a, you know wow yeah. you're preaching to the choir man uh, the hammer films of that era were gold yes they were and it, it felt very much like that to me it read like a gothic horror play because the whole film takes place for the most part in one big gothic tudor haunted house you know <sighs> So that's what kind of brought the hammer element uh, to it for me. But there's also feelings, you know, some of the visuals do feel a little bit like the grudge. Uh, they do feel a little bit like, you know, Samara coming up out of that well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That everybody freaks out about, you know, uh, in the ring. And, and so there is some modern imagery to uh, slants to it and flourishes to it. There's also a little bit of steampunk in the design element uh, to it as well. So that's what Perry brought to the table. I play a man named Dr. Henry Tanner, and his wife and daughter were killed by a serial killer in this, well, I have to say, a beautiful location. If we can call it a beautiful location, yeah. they shot this thing in a Gothic Tudor gingerbread house that was west of downtown Los Angeles in a wow. place called the historic West Adams District. And oh. they didn't even, you know, they didn't need to art direct the inside of it that much. It was absolutely gorgeous on the inside. Wow. Uh, holes in the walls. I mean, it looked like ghosts lived in there. And so after the funeral of the wife and the daughter, this man who has invented a machine that can track down a ghost and suck it up and generate ectoplasm out of it, uh, he takes his protege, uh, the assistant, uh, who is the computer programmer, and the fellow's girlfriend and another young lady into that house against the police wishes, you know, we sort of break in there to get the machine fired up and snap up their ghosts before their spirits are lost forever. Mm -hmm. And I found myself with a great cast of young people. Francesca Santoro plays Amy, the reporter. Liz Fenning plays my uh, computer programmer, Jessica. God, she did a great job. Uh, she also studied at the Commedia dell'arte in Italy, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, what was that like? You know, those mm -hmm. are the people that do the acting with the masks. Right. David O'Donnell is my protege. Phyllis Spielman is, is my wife in that who's passed on. And we just had a hell of a time in that house for a few weeks while we shot this great film. It's a very emotional piece. Everybody's emotions were at high stake during this whole thing. And so the executives, when they started to see the dailies at Asylum, they went, oh, my God, we haven't made a film like this 
and they came to visit the set just, you know, smiles ear to ear. Holy mackerel, we're making a real dramatic horror film. And so there you go. And I think people uh, have been very pleased with it. it. It was released in July on Amazon and Vimeo and Video On Demand and DVD. And uh, for the usual asylum uh, crowd, they've been in shock. It's a pretty creepy film. As a matter of fact, two of my Star Trek fan ladies uh, in costume who showed up uh, recently at one of my tables, they looked at the, the Ghost Hunters poster and they said, no, absolutely not. We're not going to go see that. <laughs> They said, no, too scary, you know. But then they looked at Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter, which is a sci-fi film that I did for Neil Johnson, which is coming out soon. And they said, we'll go see that instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. So that's, that's, that's the history of Ghost Hunters. I'm, I'm grateful to Perry. It was a great role and a uh, wonderful cast. I, I love all of the people I was working with. They did a great job. Yeah. And I got a nice. Uh, Best Actor Award for Ghost Hunters a couple of weeks ago at the Malibu West International Film Festival. Yay! That is there incredible. Man, that's nice. That's kind yeah. of nice to have that, isn't it? It's well, to get the kind of it's, <laughs> it's validation. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It's it validation. Is. Yes. It is validation, you know? So we all worked very hard. Everybody deserved great accolade for that. How did you be, uh, how were you uh, um, approached to play the part in that film? Well, I submitted myself. Uh, there's a service called the Actors Access, which is owned by the Breakdown Services, you know, and that's generally how most of the roles come through. And I submitted a a, oh, a pretty in-depth audition for that. It was two big, chunky monologues that Perry had actually written as audition themes. It wasn't scenes from the script. He took ideas and concepts from the script and formed them into character monologues. And I guess I auditioned with I don't know how many guys, but whatever I did seemed to work. But I saw an awful lot in Dr. Tanner's character. Uh, unfortunately, my own wife has uh, suffered from cancer for a long time. Uh, we have a little girl. We all went through that. So, mm -hmm. you know, go method, take out your life experiences mm -hmm. and throw them right in there. And that's what I did. And uh, apparently it, it read through. And I went down to Los Angeles for a couple of in-person screen tests with Perry and then also with the casting directors uh, over at uh, the asylum. And uh, uh, Scotty Mullen was casting that. And so after the third one, I got the call. I nailed that job. And, uh, you know, when I say that Grandpa Soldi helped me out with the part, yes, uh, he's interned in Los Angeles. <laughs> he's in a, a mausoleum. And, you know... Over the last couple of years, I've been going and visiting Grandpa Soldi every time I have an audition or I've got a part that I have to do, and I put that camping chair in that mausoleum, and I have a big cup of coffee, and we run lines together. Oh. And so to prep, yeah, and so to prep for that, there I was with Grandpa Soldi for a few hours prepping my part before I went in to go and see Perry for the in in camera audition. So apparently, whatever I did, it worked. There you go. Wow. Is your grandfather? Now, Perry, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, Go ahead. Perry, you know, I know that we are PG, so I won't say it, but he would use an expletive and say, method actors. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, uh, is your is your grandfather interred at the uh, Hollywood Forever cemetery? No, he's not. No, he's not. He's over at the Calvary, which is now in what we call Whittier, which was actually Los Angeles at the time. Mm. And, uh, you know, they're all kind of full up. But, uh, you know, that's where he is. And uh, that's what I do when, whenever I go on something, you know. Wow, that's great. Well, that's, no, actually, I, I, I think there's, there's something really awesome about uh, about that. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> man, mm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of moved by that. I think that's a really beautiful story. Uh, thank you very much. Like I said, he was uh, I was very, very close to him. And, uh, you know, I did have a break for a while. Life gets in the way yeah. uh, for everybody. And uh, the last couple of years, I've been working like gangbusters an awful lot. And uh, I think part of the reason is I've been going and visiting Grandpa Soldi and sitting there with a cup of coffee and hashing out decisions and everything else or just trying to pick up a good vibe to take into an audition and mm -hmm. it's been working so i'm grateful uh, whatever grateful works, to him you know? and, yeah and grateful for the new work you know exactly. absolutely is there a, mm -hmm. oh did you have a question keith no i was just going to ask what uh 
other projects that are in the works or getting ready to mm-hmm. be released and where can we find you? Sure. It be a pleasure. Uh, I'm Neil Johnson, who's a science fiction filmmaker, and uh, he, his mantle is the first digital filmmaker. Uh, Neil's been doing the special effects and the digital work for his films for a long time now, and he had a movie called Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter, and it stars the lovely Tracy Birdsall is the female heroine lead in this movie, and I have a great part. Uh, as uh, the doctors uh, in the science fiction world that uh, Neil has created. Uh, His name is Ralston. And we just saw the film about a month ago, and it premiered at the Action on Film Film Festival, and Tracy actually got Best Actress at that film festival. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, I'm proud of Neil. It's one of his best, if not the best. The, The thing looks epic. It's very sensitive. There's beautiful cinematography and some wonderful moments in that movie. And it was just picked up by Sony, I'm grateful to say, and very proud of Neil and Tracy for that. And so Sony's going to be releasing it in theaters uh, very soon. Wow. I'm not sure of the date, but very, very soon. It also stars William Kircher from The Hobbit and Daz Crawford from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, Tim McGrath has a wonderful part in there. So that was a wonderful experience, too. It's great to be a part of that. So... Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter should be coming out soon. And there's a web series called The Idiot by director and writer Chris Cranock. It's being pitched to Netflix uh, awful uh, soon. And so uh, you can see that on The Idiot TV. So we're, we're hold a lot out there for Chris. And then there's a movie called Snow Black. It's a Fred Williamson film. And it's being directed by Robert Parham and produced by Tim Beale for Mayhem Films. And they've asked me to be a part of that. So I'm trying to keep as busy as I can. I'm so happy for all of the filmmakers and their projects that have come out. And you know something? As an actor, when you got work, you're happy. <laughs> right? Oh, no question about it. No uh, I was looking at, at, your, uh, at your, your credits, and there's something that you are credited with uh, that I want to ask about. You, you were mm-hmm. playing a cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking, gruff pilot in Curse of the Phantom Shadow. <laughs> Now that uh, now yes. the title alone got my attention, but please tell us about that as well. That is a project that's being developed by a director named Mark Ross. He's got a series uh, of of films that he would like to get off of the ground. You small small episodes. You have an ongoing thing, so it's not finished yet. Uh, but Mark has a very, very stylized world that he's created. Everything is retro 1940s mixed with a little bit of science fiction in there, you know, and I play Captain Reynolds, who is a cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking straight out of the flask while he's behind the yoke of his B-25 bomber. Wow. (laughs) Which, you know, he patched together with scotch tape and a couple of other things. Uh, You know, he's got a very leggy assistant who looks like kind of a Varga girl. It's a great, uh, a great uh, looking piece. And uh, there's an, a secret agent in there uh, who just does not understand my take on life. And I think, of course, that he's a little bit too serious. But it's, it's a great looking piece. So when Mark finishes that all up, I'm sure uh, everybody will get a, a great kick out of what he's created. Well, please keep us informed when, that is, uh, when, when he's ready to show that, because that sounds like something I think we could really, really enjoy. Uh, looking sure. at looking at your work, um, mm-hmm. I, I'm curious. And obviously, an actor's desire is to just just be working, and there's no question mm-hmm. about it. You're really busy these days, and I think that's that's mm-hmm. awesome that you are. Uh, Thank you. But I've, I've noticed that you're you tend to fall into the more genre era uh, areas of, of film, you know, be it horror or sort of mm-hmm. a light sci-fi. Uh, is there a specific mm-hmm. area of of uh, movies or TV that you that you find that that you gravitate towards, or that you would really like to, maybe not necessarily pigeon your, pigeonhole yourself in, but kind of like really sink your teeth into, shall we say? Okay, I could write a novel with that, but I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the best answer I can with that. When I was very small and I started in the film industry, like I said, I played kids who died all the time, you know? <laughs> right. And uh, 
yeah, you know, I was handicapped and, uh, you know, played a war orphan and all that type of stuff. When I was a later teenager, I began to play a little bit more of the all-American kind of a guy, but I still had kind of a heavy slant on me all the time. I think the most all-American I ever played was a young guy traveling on the love boat, uh, hitting on Nancy McKeon, who was, you know, training to be a gymnast, and Alex Cord, who was her dad, came to chew me out on the love boat. Uh, in the end, in in the end, all was great, and I got my first screen kiss, a really hot one with Nancy McKeon. I'll never forget that, you know. Uh, so I was kind of, I don't want to say typecast or pigeonholed for many years. But I was studying at the Beverly Hills Playhouse at the time. I was 18, 19 years old. And after I did Star Trek, you know, Milton Katselis, who ran the Playhouse, and my coach, Bill Howie, they kind of agreed that I needed to get some life experience because I was too young to play the types of things that they thought I was good at. You know, I was sort of out of sync with my peer group and out of sync with my physicality. And I just looked a little bit gangly and awkward, you know, to playing leading men. So playing this stuff recently has been fantastic, man. I have played, you know, the leader of the Hells Angels in the 1970s, you know, Ghost Hunters. What a wonderful part to play. And I'll tell you, one of the funnest things I've ever did that I absolutely loved, I got to play Charlie Beaudry, who was one of the gunslingers that rode with Billy the Kid Mm -hmm. in Billy the Kid's fight against the Murphy Dolan House in New Mexico. And that was a project for Kevin Costner. So, uh, you know, the work as of lately has been great. Can I pigeonhole myself into one sort of genre? I don't think so. I, I've played multiple, you know, horror, sci-fi, Western, you know, getting shot at the end like Charlie did, you know, when they thought he was Billy by accident. So um, I love all of them. There's not really one. The happiest moments for me were when I was riding across the plains of New Mexico with Billy, or I was, you know, terrorizing people when all hell broke loose in Ghost Hunters, or when I was helping, you know, Tracy Birdsall's character fight against official intelligence in Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter, I realized to myself I didn't fall into the child actor who couldn't move on. I finally moved on. It just took an awful lot longer than I thought it would. But I tell you, when I put that gun in that holster and mounted up on that horse, you know, and Billy said, hey, let's go, it was a great moment for me. Mm -hmm. I finally realized I had broken that boundary down. Mm -hmm. Because some of the poor people don't, you know. And it's because it's very difficult, difficult business when you grow up as a child or a teenage actor. It's very hard to make the jump like Kurt Russell did to become a leading man. It's a very difficult thing. So he's one of my heroes as well just for doing that. So I think that's the best way for me to answer that question. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, (laughs) that's probably the best (laughs) answer I could have ever hoped to hear. Uh, I, uh, Wow, you've really just, uh, I don't know what to say, except this has been one of the most entertaining conversations we've had in a very, very long time. this has been a great interview. It's fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, I mean, clearly we want to have you back on. The next time you've got something uh, that's about to come out, we want to have you back on again so we can talk about it because uh, you've... You not only put an interesting perspective on what you're doing now, but the the wealth of history that you that you have brought with you as well, I think is highly enlightening, especially the way it it molds and shapes how you approach roles today. So uh, let let me just ask this: for anybody who wants to learn more about you and mm-hmm. your work, uh, both past, mm-hmm. present, and upcoming. Do you have any website, social media, any place on the interwebs, anything like that 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 people can go see? Yes. Now, now our pre-conversation. Shall I send them to the telex or the mimeograph machine? <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the old fax machine. <laughs> right. right. I don't know, I'm thinking okay. mimeograph. I'm like, oh, that smell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I know it. You know, uh, Twitter. It's Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Manley, M-A-N-L-E-Y, and then the numbers 12, right? Stephen Manley, 12, that's the Twitter. There is a website, www.stephen, and then there's a hyphen, the little dash, manley.com, 
right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a Facebook fan page, which is forward slash Stephen Michael Manley, which is my my full name. And there's links to all of these things. There's links to Ghost Hunters. There's links to Chris Cranox the Idiot. There's updates on Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter. You'll probably see some pictures of me as Charlie Baudry from Mississippi. You know, there's stuff like that in there, too. So all the news updates, everything is there on, on one of those three um, sites that you can see. Wow. wow, fantastic. This, is, this has really been great. I mean, uh, what we could talk with you for for hours. There is no question uh -huh. about it because uh you you have so much to share and there's such wonderful history and I I think a lot of people could learn from your knowledge and your experience working uh not not just that you uh, learned from your grandfather but also from uh, your time on the set. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, um, I when I would do the Star Trek conventions, there were a lot of old timers, I have to say, that were still around. You know, uh, unfortunately, they're leaving us slowly. Richard yeah, Keel was a very good yeah. friend of mine. Uh, just lost Barry Jenner, who was a character actor, you know, yeah. who was a good friend of mine, too, yeah. you know. And those were all guys to learn from over the years, either working with them directly or indirectly, because I knew somebody who knew them, you know. So I'm very, very blessed that way and uh, try to keep that uh, that legacy and that work ethic up for people, you yes, know. That's wonderful. Yeah. Just wonderful. Well, thank you, Stephen Manley, for being on the show this week. Oh, thank you, fellas. This has been a delight. You, you know, you have an actor here who once you ask him a question, I can talk for a long time. So there have been Star Trek people who come to my table who ask me a question, and they fall asleep while I'm still answering their <laughs> questions. Well, we are still very much wide awake. Yes. So, uh, But, yes, thank you very much, and I hope we can have you on the show again in the future. Oh, I look forward to it. Anytime, please reach out. I'm there for you. All right, thank you. Yeah, baby. They're like two gay geeks. They're together, you know. They're two gay guys and they're geeks. Is that okay? And here are a few selected birthdays for October 10th through October 12th, 2016. October 10th. Hey, is that Ira there? No, that's Ben Vereen. Oh, Ben Vereen. He can what really a talent. Dance. What a talent. <laughs> yeah. That's not Ira. <laughs> that's not Ira. Yeah. Also, October 10th. Well, it was Ben Vereen's birthday, that is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Also, October 10th, Manu Bennett. The man of many, many faces. Many faces. And Ed Wood, as well as... Joe Green, the opera better known composer. As, as, as better known as Giuseppe Verdi. Yes, October 11th. Don French. Oh, my gosh. What Vicar is, of Dibley. <laughs> Vicar of Dibley. Oh, my gosh. Some, a friend of ours turned us on to that. Uh, Thank many, you. Many years ago. Oh, my God. What a crazy series. Love that, was. that show. She is just wonderful. Also, October 11th in 1844, Henry Hines of Pickle and Ketchup fame. October 12th, Hugh Jackman. Joan Rivers and Luciano Pavarotti. October 13th, Paul Simon and Marie Osmond. October 14th, Roger Moore, Harry Anderson, who, wow. who did Night Court and, and disappeared. <laughs> he, yeah, and he, was, uh, he and his wife had the most amazing magic act that they did together. Then they, they I mean, they're still married, but they just killed the act and... And then he went to sitcoms and then vanished. Just kind of disappeared off the planet. Yeah, he played Houdini. Yeah. So also on October 14th, Justin Hayward and uh, Interestingly a, a enough. star of silent films, Lillian Gish, born in 1896. October 15th, Penny Marshall, Penny Marshall. and uh, Emeril Lagasse. As well as Richard Carpenter, who is of the Carpenter's fame. He's right. done things uh, this, you know. Well, he tries to keep the Carpenter legacy still going. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of nice. And let's see. Also, uh, Greek storyteller Virgil, born in 70 B.C. What's special about Virgil? He wrote the Aeneid. Oh, did he? Yes, he did. And uh, he was just, you know. Very, very 
prolific. Okay. October 16th, Angela Lansbury and Oscar Wilde. And that is it for the birthdays this time. Forget about whether Han shot first. He did. Is it true that Han Solo teamed up with a six-foot green rabbit? Did Darth Vader profess a devotion to the immortal gods of the Sith? And did Leia's unhealthy attraction to her brother grow for years? Ew. Hi, I'm voice actor Michael Corley, and I want to answer these questions and more on the Vox Box Star Wars comic book podcast. Each Vox Box episode covers classic Star Wars comics, starting with the original Marvel series in 1977 all the way to the present day. So tune in, have some fun, and may the Force be with you at VoxBoxPodcast.com. Go give a listen to our friends over at Vox Box Star Wars Podcast. And now, it's time for what? The dance. The dance. Do the dance. Techno dancing. Techno dancing. Everybody do the dance. If you can't see us, we're moving our arms up. Yeah. So, it's time for feedback. So, uh, we recently ran an article where we shared the new trailer for the upcoming Pirates of the Caribbean. Dead men tell no tales. Well, Brian Weber had this to say. Dead men tell no tales and Live Arkle is not seeing this movie. Anyone who knows me can easily guess why. Hmm. Brian, please... Buddy, tell us how you really feel. Yeah. And then we recently also shared the teaser trailer for the upcoming Doctor Who spinoff series, Class. And good friend of the show, Mark Biaggi, wrote, I hope BBC America carries it and we aren't left behind like they did with Sarah Jane Adventures. Well, let's just say, uh, Mark, uh, if you look at, and for anybody who's wondering about that, at the bottom of the article, uh, we do share that BBC America plans to uh, broadcast the series class sometime in 2017. They were originally going to do it 2016, but they've updated the schedule. It will now be in 2017. And uh, in response to that, uh, a friend of Mark's named David Thun, he wrote, Sadly, Elizabeth Slayton's untimely death made it impossible to continue Sarah Jane Adventures. And yeah, yes, I... <laughs> oh my gosh. I still weep over that because I yeah. loved that show and I loved her. It was great. And she worked up till almost the very so last She day. did work I up mean, to the just, end. Wow. She did work up to the end. I you mean, never knew she was sick. You had no idea. And, and Doctor Who fans are still mourning her passing. She was just such, such a force of nature for that show. And then uh, we also ran a story about how Disney is hitting the live action remake button yet again. Yet this again. time with Mulan. And they're planning to do that for theaters in 2018. And the More Gooder Than podcast, uh, they asked the question Ooh, who would you cast as Mulan? And then, of course, I responded with. I would cast Ming Na Wen as Mulan. She has the whole warrior thing down. And then uh, More Gooder came back and responded with something that we, we sh I should have known. Is that it doesn't hurt that she voiced Mulan in the original animated movie. And then I had replied back to that. Oh, heck, I didn't even realize that. Oops. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> And then uh, we also ran a story, and we talked a little bit about this, about how aliens in the new Star Trek series, they're going to be changing when uh, the new series Discovery premieres. And good friend Pia de los Muertos, she oh. wrote, I'm a bit weary of all the changes. But then again, Brian Fuller is a freaking genius, and I can't wait to see what he came up with. That reminds me, I need to rewatch his Hannibal series. So good. I forgot that he did Hannibal. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. And then we got a message from Dr. Christy Hartman, and she was asking us about Westworld. And she wrote, Are you two fine gentlemen watching Westworld on HBO yet? Now, first let me point out that she wrote gentlemen in the singular, so I'm assuming she meant you. Uh, 
Because well, there's nothing you know, fine about I, me. Uh-huh, nothing right. fine about me. She must have been talking about you. Yeah. Uh, but she was asking, Did, are we watching Westworld yet on HBO? And uh, the answer is yes. We just watched episode two uh, as of Saturday night. And just really quickly, um, what are your what are you thinking of the show? Oh my gosh, I'm I'm wow. I'm really really intrigued with it, yes, and I'd go so far much. to say, even though uh, we talked about it with you, I talked about it with Eugene Glover on the Fusion Patrol podcast, and apparently, uh, the the book which was novelized from the movie, if I right. remember my history right, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. apparently, you know, Crichton had this. I, I think I think Crichton had an idea for Westworld did the screenplay first and then did the book but I think his original idea for Westworld is more in line I'm just guessing with what the HBO series has oh yeah because I, I this can is, see that because it, it just it's so cryptic right now it's and very it's, cryptic and, and, it's and it's going ends, into a weird, really weird direction it but asks it, some it really is deep Crichton. <laughs> it is it, and it really asks some deep questions about what is life uh, the origin of sin. Uh, it's painting man as God and the host yeah. as man. I mean, it's just such. It is. It is really filled with a lot of themes. Yeah. So I, I think it's a brilliant series, and I can't wait to see where it goes. And then lastly, we got a message from somebody named Tommy Cannon. We saw him a couple of months ago. Yes. It was a live table reading for uh, the big birthday for Jack Kirby, and he kind of did the voice of I believe it was Orion. Yes. Orion. So yeah, Orion. So he left us a message on our website saying, "Hi there, two gay geeks. In less than three weeks, Doctor Zombie is hosting his final film screening. The film will be The Brain That Wouldn't Die. It's horror and sci-fi. We will riff this awful film apart. There will be a costume contest, an art contest, and an acting contest. Sponsored by the Trunk Space and Hamster Labs." It's Saturday, October 29th at 8 p.m. at Super Saver Cinemas near I-17 and Bell Road, that's North Phoenix, in the same plaza as the 13th floor haunted house. Mm. $10, and we're using Indiegogo to get people to buy admission in advance and get some freaky perks, long unlive the zombies. Thank you, Tommy. And there cool. we will have a link for this for the Dr. Mo- Dr. Zombies movie Lab of Terror. We'll have a link uh, to the, the Indiegogo campaign on our show notes for this episode that will be fun to go to sadly we're going to be in cottonwood that yeah, day hopefully we'll be back in time hopefully we can make it back in time maybe, maybe maybe if we can we will attend because this sounds like this could be a terrible amount of fun and that is our feedback for this week a horrible amount of fun horrible amount of fun yes yeah well, thank you, everyone, for all of your comments. We want to hear from you, our listeners. We want to hear from the people that read the website. We want to hear from everybody. If you want to give us a comment, you can comment on our website at tggeeks.com. You can comment on our YouTube episode. You can comment on our Facebook page, or you can call in to our listener feedback line. Hey 469 TG Geeks. That's 469 844 3357. It's been a while, it's guys. A while. We miss yeah. hearing your voices out there. Yeah. Give us a call. You could receive a shout out and we could play your uh, comment. Play your message on, on air. air. Yes. But please be nice. Welcome, curious listeners. This is Jackson Stewart, director of Beyond the Gates. Continue listening to the Two Gay Geeks podcast, if you dare. Okay, we got a couple things, but first I want to say regarding that bumper, I really want that movie. Yes. I really want that movie badly, and I want the board game. Anyway, uh, we ran a little story um, just you know, hours ago from uh, b- prior to recording this episode about how Madame Gao, somebody, mm. some people might remember her. She was in Daredevil. She yeah. was the, uh, the heroin dealer. Yeah. She had the big heroin lab, and uh, obviously she's a very, very dangerous woman. She's going to be an Iron Fist. Ooh. And already the theories are running rampant as to who she may really be. And the popular theory is that she is, uh, in reality, 
Crane Mother, someone who was introduced in the Iron Fist She's comic a mother, books. That's a, oh, that's she, for sure. yeah. Uh, and if she is Crane Mother, she is the powerful ruler of Kun Z, one of the seven capital cities of heaven. And for anybody that knows the Iron Fist legend, uh, Danny Rand, he comes from one of the other cities, and uh, apparently they're like they don't get along. Uh, the city that he's from mm. and, and Kunzi. So there is definitely a connection, or there could be a connection uh, in terms of Danny's, uh, his inheritance as Iron Fist, uh, who Madame Gao may really be. And we need to remember, there is some very strange, mystical, strange stuff happening mm -hmm. at the end of season two of Daredevil. So I kind of wonder, yeah. are the two storylines going to come to a head? I don't know. I'm really curious, and we and in this article that we ran, we also have the recently released trailer, an actual teaser trailer with footage from Iron Fist. You had a chance to watch that earlier today. Uh, no, I didn't watch that. I oh, didn't watch no, the trailer. I, I watched everything else. Oh dear! I was trying to catch up, I didn't get to watch that one. Sorry. It's fascinating. Uh, it actually, th there is something very mystical about it. Uh, Danny, mm. when he summons the power of the Iron Fist. His hand glows. Ooh. Yeah, it, there, there's a lot of mysticism that's going to be taking place in here. I am so excited. And uh, all, all I can say is that with each new series, I get more and more excited for not only the future of the individual heroes, but how this is all going to just all dive right together. into Defenders. So this now brings up a little chat we want to have. We finally had a chance to start watching Luke Cage. Wh who what? Oh, don't you? Carl don't... Lucas, you mean? Yeah, Carl Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh well, we've only what we've seen 5 episodes. Uh, 6. Now? 6 episodes. We've seen oh, 6 gosh. episodes now of we Luke Cage. We haven't finished it. And, no, cuz we're watching like one episode a night. Well, we, it's been a busy week. It's been, it's been very, a very very busy week. week. It's been a busy so. month. Yeah. Well, busy two, two months. months, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can only catch, you know, but hey, talk we're really milking it. Let's just say it that way. Yeah. Um. I don't know when we're gonna get a chance to finish watching it. It probably probably next weekend if we can. I, I, yeah. That's my guess. Hopefully, but I I really enjoy the series. It's really really. I I love the way that they've managed to capture Harlem and that whole uh, sense of what Harlem is. Mm -hmm. And it just and, and the way they're portraying the characters. I mean, we've seen what. One white character in the entire film uh, uh, series. Yeah, so far. one of the detectives. Yeah. Well, well, then <laughs> that's he, about he, it. He, he, yeah. The, Everybody uh, else has been people of color. Oh, uh, or, or some some kind of ethnic background. You know, right. like, like Connie. Yeah. Of Genghis Connie's. Mm -hmm. People of color. Yes. Yeah. I I want I want to eat a Genghis Connie's. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I really do. I I want to try out her food because that we we see uh we see Luke eating some of her food and it looked I gotta admit it looked pretty good. Yeah. Um, is there anything about the aesthetic? of the the storytelling or or the cinematography or or just anything in the way the episodes are crafted that you really like I, I just that's hard to say i i just like the whole thing i like the way it's filmed i love the way that the actors are presented and that the way the characters are presented there's nothing that is uh they they haven't whitewashed anything no they haven't uh i mean they're stereotypical characters but they fit. They work. They're not two-dimensional yeah, caricatures, exactly. though. I mean, they're they're fully realized, and it, it, I so jeez, I don't know how is stereotypes. Just, uh, doing a great job. Oh, he's amazing. Oh, yeah, he's amazing. And uh, some of the other characters. I mean, we just finally got to meet Claire again. Yeah, we were in, re reintroduced to her. I'm excited about seeing more of her. I'm really excited to where Claire is going to come with all of this. I uh, then, of course, we have Misty Knight, our police oh, officer. Yeah. I can't wait to see how her role is going to change in all yeah, of this too, exactly. because she's you she's know it's really letter change. of the law. You know something's going to change, but she's uh, very letter of the law. And for anybody who is uh, who doesn't know, we did run a story about how there is another character that will be appearing in Iron Fist that is actually best friends with Misty Knight. So and they're going to form their own little vigilante group. Mm, so yeah. that's kind of exciting to see how Misty's character arc is going to completely shift. The, the, I think the aesthetic that I uh, that, that I'm taking away from this, and you get this right from the opening credits, and you know, for, for any of our listeners, don't take this the wrong way. It it 
it, at first it harkens back to maybe some of the black uh, black exploit. I can't say the word. Uh, there was a black exploitation phenomenon that took place in cinema in the seventies. You know, with movies like Shaft, uh, and Shaft. it 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 plays. It it gives a nod to yeah. that, but without falling into all of the trappings right and the bad and the bad stereotypes i mean it's still giving us characters that are really fully fleshed out and and believable uh i mean so, like i i am I'm, I'm so so upset that pops oh, what yeah. happened to him you yeah. know okay not going to say anything you know in case anybody hasn't watched it but then you you got like uh that chess player guy yeah i love him oh yeah and then one of the things that's interesting too, and while I'm not uh, hip hop or uh, rap uh, inclined, they've really showcased some really good music in the club. Yeah, I mean some really talented performers. I mean, it's, so this it's is really, this it's, is such uh, it's it's a beautiful show. Oh yeah, it's really. beautiful to watch. <laughs> I I love the series. I can't wait to finally get to the end of it. I mean, we've we spent one, you know, look like ten or so minutes looking at all the synopses, you know, without actually going too far yeah, into spoiler territory. Oh my gosh. It looks amazing. I can't wait to see how it ends. The nods to the comic book are hysterical. Uh, so I I love the show, and wow, I'm so excited for the future for you know Luke Cage. For Jessica Jones, for Daredevil, for Iron Fist, for The Defenders, for Punisher, I'm just excited for what Netflix is doing to the entire oh, th this this wow. this you know the the street level Marvel universe. I exactly. I'm just jazzed by it. I think yeah. it's going to be awesome. And you, we ran an article this week also on uh, the def the other Defenders kind of crashed a. A lot oh, on, that's on right! Facebook, yes, uh, with... people, check this out. Check this out. This is awesome. There was a Facebook Live Q and A with Mike Coulter at his house in L.A. and each of his co-star defenders, uh, in addition to Jeff Loeb, all called in and crashed it. It was awesome. Uh, it's it's the greatest video. We have that on our website. Well, I will include the link for that on the show notes for this episode. It is great fun to watch. Check it out, and it gives you uh, an immediate sense of the great uh, camaraderie that exists between these cast members. Mike Holder has only worked with Kristen Ritter so far, uh, Jessica Jones. He hasn't worked with Charlie Cox or with Finn Jones yet, and they haven't started filming Defenders yet. They're going to start that uh, in a few weeks. But still, this, this sense of unity between the four of them is just tremendous, which makes me even more excited for the Defenders series when we finally get it in late 2017 absolutely and of course we have some follow-up items always we have our calendar on the website that's for birthdays that's for cons for anything important events that uh we feel that uh, need to be on there. And yes, if you have something you like have like what Tommy Tommy yeah. shared with us uh, the 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 Doctor Zombie yeah, we'll thing. Put that on. Uh, there. Yeah, please let us know. We'll include that on the calendar. Yep, we're going to put a, a couple of other things uh, on the calendar. So if there's something that needs to be on the calendar, let us know. And as you've figured out, we do like independent creators. Big not, time. Not just film creators of any kind of creative independent outlets. writers yeah. it, it doesn't matter comic book artists yeah and uh, please support them support those independent artists they are turning out some really really good stuff and we're not just saying that either i mean their work is absolutely brilliant yep absolutely and support them if you run across a uh, a website that they're looking for money to do a project or something, please consider it. It uh, even as little as a dollar or five dollars helps uh, support independent creators. Yeah, and speaking of independent creators, uh, Russ Emanuel just uh, brought uh, he he uh, shared uh, occupants at another film festival. Yep. It's 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 it won more awards. Brianna, she just won a uh, best actress. Oh, far out. So cool. hey, good you know good for and, them. And he's got a new. Um, uh, film at uh, Assassin's Apprentice. That yes. Is, uh, independent film and that he's going to be directing. Uh, check that out on Indiegogo. There, uh, is it Kickstarter or Indiegogo? I, his is Kickstarter. His is Kickstarter, his Kickstarter yes. Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter Assassin's Apprentice yes. by Russ Emanuel. Phoenix Comic Con Fan Fest 16, October 22nd, 23rd, downtown Phoenix at the Convention Center. There, they've got quite a few guests that they have. Uh, Announced. So, if you want to check out more about Phoenix Comic Con Fan Fest, check out our article and phoenixcomiccon.com. 
Cottonwood Comic Book Show. This is the second appearance of yeah. this. They, they did their first one last year, and then uh, the Verde Valley Comic Expo. That was about six months later. Spawned that, and they're doing the Cottonwood Comic Book Show again, coming up October 29th at Cornerstone Church in Cottonwood, Arizona. It's only five bucks. It is worth the oh, drive please, up, yes. to, up to Cottonwood to see some great independent artists. We, we're going to have a table there. <clears throat> we're going to have our show there. We're going to have our show there. There's going to be a lot of local artists. There's like a handful of artists that live right in the Cottonwood area. Yeah, It's amazing and, yes. the, 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 the talent that lives up in the central to northern Arizona region. As well as uh, they're going to have a few artists from the Phoenix area. Special guests are going to be Stephen Reed, Mike Gallagher, and Brian Augustine. Check out our article for more information. Yes. Now, i got to give some thanks to some wonderful people who continue to share our stories. First off, we want to give thanks to Doctor Who Talking Who. They are on Twitter. They publish the Doctor Who Fancast Guide, and they republish our, and share our stories quite regularly. We are very happy with that. And you can find that by going to Twitter. They are at Talking Who. And in the same manner, we have our good friend Brian Weber. He, on Twitter, is known as Social Justice Scald, and he puts out the Arkle Times Post Dispatch News, where our stories show up quite frequently. And we thank Brian, and we thank Doctor Who, Talking Who, uh, you know, from the bottom of our hearts. We really appreciate the fact that they share our stuff. And as far as Brian goes, he also has a presence on Tumblr. He has the incorrect Star Trek Voyager quotes, which can be a lot of fun to uh, read. And we have one. Have one right here. Captain Ransom says, please tell me you're going to appeal to my humanity. And Captain Janeway says, uh, actually, I'm planning to threaten you. That is so not Star Trek. <laughs> please. Anyway. I can't believe actually so someone actually applied that quote to, to Voyager. I am shocked. I mean, uh, wow. I mean, whoever whoever did that needs to have their um, their their uh, their geek card ripped away from them. Anyway, anyway, and then uh, we also have to give a special thanks to Sci Fi Obsession. They continually republish our stories every day. They are on Facebook, and you can find them by going to facebook dot com slash sci fi ob. That's S C I F I O B. Yes, thank you. We want to give a shout out to the Lucky Show, the twins. Oh my gosh, what a great, what a great twin team we have yes. in them. They give us lots of love on Twitter, and they are on Twitter at Lucky Show, and they have a YouTube episode or a YouTube channel that's called Lucky Show. They do reviews of older movies, and they're really quite a hoot. And not just bad movies. I mean, sometimes oh, some really, really good, good cinema yeah. classics. And, and some really great interviews. They ana analyze the an analyze. Yes. They analyze the analyze. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I got to look that one up. Yeah. Uh, then we must give special thanks to the Facebook group, The Gay Geek, because they are unbelievably awesome, filled with unbelievably awesome people and unbelievably awesome content. A lot of my iPhone wallpaper I get from them because they're just phenomenal. And they have the most awesome moderator. His name is Jeremiah Reeves. He gave us his blessing to share our episodes at that on that page. And you can read it by going to facebook.com slash groups slash the gay geek. Thank you, Jeremiah. You are awesome. We want to remind you to occasionally click on one of our Amazon ads at the bottom of each article and the widgets on the side. Doesn't cost anything and you don't have to buy anything. It and if you do decide to buy something, click on one of our search ads and we get a little bit of a kickback. Thank you for your consideration. And lastly, please, please, please rate us on iTunes. Yes, we really we would appreciate it. Yeah, we really would appreciate it. That way, anytime someone does a search on geek podcasts or gay geek or anything along those lines with those keywords, the better the rating, the more our podcast rises to the surface. Yes, thank you. Up next time. Oh, big episode next time. Big episode. Episode number 100. We're going to do kind of a, a little retrospective and a our thoughts on the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. With yeah. 
uh, your podcast with my partner, podcast co-host on Fusion Patrol, Glover. Eugene Glover. He'll be yeah, joining us for that. So he's going to join us. We're going to talk about Star Trek, among other things. So stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, that should do it for this webcast episode of TG Geeks. Be sure to check out our article for the webcast episode. We have several links on the page. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website at tggeeks.com or you can leave us a voicemail at 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. From TG Squared Studios, I'm Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. I bid you peace. Cheers. <laughs>